Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to Radio Works World. My name is Dr. Jill Barham, and uh, I'm your Miracle Molecule host, as you know, and I'm very, very happy to say that on this beautiful Sunday morning, it's raining here, I'm in uh, up north somewhere, um, I've, my special guest today is the amazing Sarah Sparks. Good morning. Morning, Jill, morning all. Yeah, lovely to see you on this lovely morning. It's unusual for me to be doing a Sunday uh, live broadcast, actually, uh, because uh, those of you that know me know that I live in the middle of, frankly, nowhere and get a rubbish signal. But I'm at Cheryl's today with her lovely bamboo here. Mm, it does bamboo. look great. Do you think yeah. it suits me? Do you think it it suits does. Me? It does. About it's me. Me. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm able to do um, a lovely, light-hearted conversation with a cup of tea, what, what's difficult about that? On a Sunday morning. Well, I'm in London, Jill, and it's raining here too. Oh, is but it? It's okay. very green. It's lovely. Yeah, well, I agree. yeah. I love this time of year, all the beautiful colours on the trees and everything. Um, you know, having travelled up uh, from where I live through and over the top of the moor, you know, just wonderful. It's, I, I sometimes forget to drive around. <laughs> to see to see the beautiful countryside at this time so we've got a welcome from uh i'm assuming that's marina welcome sarah can't wait to listen to your stardust story we've got so we've got people online already um so we're just gonna have a great time so listen um for those of you who haven't watched the show before there's a particular format and the format starts with me giving my very special guest the opportunity to tell me, first of all, Sarah, what you're passionate about, what you love to do, what's happening in the world of business for you at the moment. Well, I am finding myself, which is very, very exciting. I've been working as a coach since 1999, so a long time. But what I've come out of the covers about recently and I'm really passionate about is helping people get out of that busy trap and to be more in control of their day. So I'm here and I'm in the process of creating an online community where stressed people can really go and be supported. And I share how to strategy so that they can get more in charge of their day and feel so much better about themselves. And um, it's been a very, very exciting journey, which I'm sure will come out as part of our conversation, no doubt. But I'm no doubt. And do you work with men or women? Just tell us. Well, that's very interesting. Over my time as an executive coach one-to-one, -one, it's been predominantly women. I'm ex-Goldman Sachs, I'm ex-financial services, I deal a lot with financial services companies and law firms, and there are more men than women in those um, uh, environments. Um, so one-to-one -one work tends to be more men than women, but only just. And then, interestingly enough, the work that I'm doing around thriving and how to do things differently predominantly it's women. So I run master classes and groups and predominantly it's women who turn up and who are willing to share in that environment. Mm. So as a, as a consequence, I'm also creating some content that men will find more comfortable to access. So but that's in the pipeline, not yet happened. <laughs> well, we'll talk a little bit about more about that at the end of the call. Um, I, I'll, do, I'll definitely give you an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, looking but, but the rest of this call, darling is all about you and i've been very good you did tell me that you asked the same questions of everybody and i've been very good and i've not peaked but as a consequence i feel oh i wonder whether i'm going to be able to answer these questions <laughs> yeah you definitely will <laughs> so um if you haven't watched the program before guys um i just want to explain to you a little bit about the the kind of background of creating the show so this is show number something like 46 or 48 in a series of 52 shows. So um, I'll explain to you why I'm doing 52 shows in a minute. So um, basically one of my all time favorite Radio 4 shows is Desert Island Discs. Do you know that show, Sarah? Yeah, I do and I love it too. I don't listen to it often enough, but when I do, I love every single one because I get to know the person. Yeah, exactly. And I've got it on podcast, actually. It's one of the things, one of my favorite things to play in the car if I'm driving a long way. And you're right. So one of the reasons that I like it is because they, they, they invite people from all walks of life. And like my show, they have a standard kind of format. So everybody gets to choose eight records. They are sent off to a virtual desert island. They get the Bible and the works of Shakespeare. They're allowed to choose one of their eight discs and a, a luxury and, um, and a, a book of their choice. And what it does for me 
is, as you say, is you might have had an opinion about that person who you might know or not know, or you've got an opinion about them because of the role that they do or the job that they have. But throughout this conversation, you actually get to know these people much better. Um, and therefore, um, what, I, what, I, what I wanted to do was to create a show that forms that kind of connection uh, and just gives you glimpses of the person behind the Thrive Academy or the, the business or, or whatever it is. Because uh, in, in, as we know in this world, that people will really only really want to work with you if they know, love and trust you. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is a great so, yeah, it is. And um, it means that, you know, we're not going to delve too much into uh, into mm. everything because we've only got, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes. But we're just going to get those little snapshots, basically. So all the questions that I'm going to ask you are the same. And as you said, you don't know what I'm going to ask you. Um, and then what's going to happen is that the 252 interviews, say one we read, one we read for a year, are being put into a commissioned book, which is being launched in London on November the 18th and 19th at um, a Stardust Awards event mm. uh, and this book will contain everybody's um, transcriptions from their uh, their interview with me so we'll know exactly who said what to what question and how many similar question answers we've got and so it's going to be a really interesting thing to, to delve into. Mm. Exciting. Uh, again are they mostly women, men, both? Both. Of your yes. Yeah, both men and women yeah absolutely so um what we're going to do is we're going to get going with uh, the questions if that's right you ready that's good. Good. Okay. <laughs> so look, my first question is actually a random scenario and okay. i've got a bit of an echo because we have got a bit of an echo uh, so bear with me i know i'm sorry is it going to be good enough yeah. so um the first thing we're going to do is uh, i'm going to put you in a virtual situation so you're in a hotel uh, you've walked uh -huh. through the lobby on the bottom floor you're going into the lift or the elevator the lift or the elevator and one other person gets in the lift yeah. you. you're going to the top floor for lunch and uh you, as, you, as you go up the lift gets stuck between floor six and seven now Okay. There's some no. bad news and some good news. There's okay. some bad news and some good news. Okay. So they phone okay. you. Yeah, they phone you. And they say, I'm sorry, you're going to be in there. I'm sorry, you're going to be in there. Hour. Something like that. Um, but the good news is that you've got windows in this lift. So you're not going to connect with the phone. And the other bit of good news is you get to choose you get to who the choose other person was who person got into was that lift with that. you. So if anybody in the world, dead or alive, who would you choose to spend two or three hours with um, in that lift mm. so that uh, you could ask them all the questions that you've ever wanted to ask them and then uh, get to know them a bit or whatever. So somebody dead or alive, who is that person that you'd want to know all those questions from? Do I have to really to one? The echo. Sorry? Do I really need to stick to one person? Yes, you have to have one person. <laughs> Okay, that's hard. Um, obviously, people like Mandela and Obama and others are coming to mind. But actually, I'm going to choose Michelle Obama. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has chosen that one, but... Um, well, here's the thing. I can't wait to there's, a, there's a bit of a secret about that, but the, you know, people will have to watch to find out who else chooses Michelle uh, Obama or read the book, in fact. In fact, they'll have to read the book to find out who else chooses Michelle Obama. Okay, so what do you want to know from Michelle Obama? Oh, so many things. Um, I'd love to know what's going on in her and her husband's mind right now in the world. <laughs> we find ourselves in this crazy place and um, how certain things are being dismantled. Um, I'd love to know what's going on in, uh, right now. And what are they doing? You know, what, what are they getting up to? Because I know she's got a passion about bringing out the talent of other women. So how is she doing that? I'd love yeah. to be able to persuade her to stand as um, next president or at least have a go because I think she'd have amazing support um, and she's just the sort of leader we want. Um, but there is something I'd really love to know from her is how does she keep her relationship alive with Barack? Because it feels and looks to me like they have a very special relationship and I'm getting tearful just thinking about it. So <laughs> I'd love to know how they do that and what makes it so special. Um, and the other thing that comes to mind, um, mm -hmm. she did um, 
a carpool karaoke with um, so I think we, we might actually get to doing elevator karaoke. <laughs> thing. Um, but we'd probably flick through our phones and find something that we could do together. That would be that yeah. would be fun. That's a great that's a great idea. I love that idea. Okay, so fabulous. Um all right, so now Michelle is hungry too. Okay, so she was going to lunch at the hungry. hotel. Yeah, she's hungry. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to magic you up a lovely table with cutlery and crockery and mm. um, silverware. And uh, like Harry Potter, I'm also going to magic you up your favorite food that you would like to share with Michelle Obama. So what would you eat and drink? It's what, what you want. I mean, obviously, we, we, we'd be happy if she likes it too. But I'm really interested to eat and drink. Um. So that is challenging. Come forward, Sarah. Just come forwards a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that is challenging me because um, I would probably choose differently if I was choosing for her. But if it's choosing for me, choosing for it's you, all about me. it's all about you, darling. <laughs> um, well, for me, obviously, the company really matters when I'm enjoying a good meal. So I've got that. Uh, also, the environment really matters. So a very simple uh, setup: white tablecloth. But it would be definitely simple with a white tablecloth. <laughs> and then I would choose um, simple food, but uh, things that I love. So scallops, just very lightly cooked scallops, um, maybe with a real rocket salad of some description. Um, followed, actually, I would have to have a glass of champagne with that. That, that would be good. I think that's um, the law, yes. <laughs> then I would probably, I mean, it, if if we were really hungry, this is probably what we'd do. Well, I would do suggest anyway. And then we'd have the most delicious fillet steak with very fine cut chips, and again, probably more salad. And followed by my favourite pudding in the world, which is creme brulee. Ah, well, I'm joining you because <laughs> they're all the things that I yeah, like. Have to, we'd have to spend at least two and a half, three hours eating this because yeah. all of those things are quite rich in themselves. So that's well, fine. I'm, you're there for two or three hours, so that's fine. Yeah, that works no, really well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant. All right, so thank you very much for sharing that. It's really interesting. And uh, if people read the book, then they'll find out why. Okay, so now I'm going to take you back to the 18-year-old Sarah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you share with us a little bit about where you were when you were 18, what you were doing, where you were living, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I was brought up in Norfolk. I was born in Streatham in London, but when I was 18 months old, I moved to Norfolk where my two younger siblings were born. So I'm one of four. I'm number two of four. My mother was 25 and had four young children to look after. How does she do that? Crazy woman. Well, I know one of the, how, one, I know how she did it in part because she had this lovely, um, I guess you'd call them an au pair now, but home help mm. called Dinah who was, um, yes, not very experienced, but she was delightful. But when I was 18, she would have left. She wouldn't be with us by then. But at 18, I was a skinny little thing, hugely lacking in confidence, um, wasn't doing very well at school. I failed my 11 plus, and I really had to work hard. I won lots of awards for effort, but my grades were pretty poor. And it's, um, I didn't know back then I had dyslexia, which I uh -huh. think would have been. But um, I had a boyfriend, my first ever boyfriend, um, who we're still in contact now, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to walk to and from school together every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my best friend was called Alison. And she played um, squash for England. So we practiced and trained together most days. So I was very fit. And I played squash for the county at the time, and she played squash for England. But I didn't have that competitive spirit. I, if the other person wanted to win, I was a people pleaser. <laughs> I just let them. <laughs> so um, I was a bit gawky and very boy looking, like had very short hair and um, flat chested. If only that was the case now. But anyway, <laughs> I've got more curves than I'd like to care about. But um, that's what well, I think. Well, so where, where, so where, where are you? Well, yeah. um, so we originally were by the water. My father was a boat builder, um, building concrete boats. I know that sounds an anathema, doesn't it? Building concrete boats. Uh, that was based in Roxham and Horning. And then we moved to a place called Framingham Piggott. Uh -huh. 
Um, which was in Framingham Yes, Framingham 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 Framingham. Yeah, very close to Framingham Mall. Um, and it was about six or seven miles outside of Norwich on the way to Lowestoft. I went but to they, university oh, in Norwich. Did you? University of East Anglia. So I had a job when I was 18 at Elm Hill Coffee Shop. Do you know the one at the top of Elm Hill, the pink? Um, you probably would have served me. I probably would have done. I probably would have done. I loved it. It's a Saturday job, and I loved it. And I just adore their flapjacks and shortbread, which is my thing. You know, I, I do quite a bit of baking, and flapjacks and shortbread are my thing. That's cool. So, so what were you listening to at 18? Oh, music-wise? Hmm. Well, that is one question I did consider, that you, because of the desert island disconnection, you might ask me. And I was going to be mortally embarrassed because um, my first LP I bought, God knows why, and one of my very few LPs I bought was Gustav Holtz's The Planets. Why would, you be, why would you be embarrassed by that? Well, we're not a classical musical family. I must have been influenced by somebody passing through. <laughs> but I remember that being my first... Um, uh, LP I bought, but the, in terms of what I was listening to back then, I'm not very good on dates, but um, Daniel with my Elton John um, yeah. is the one that comes to mind. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I was, my elder sister was very um, leggy, beautiful blonde leggy girl and loved Top of the Pops and I used to think all those hot pants, which is what was going on at the time, um, were really, really not very, very, very nice thing to do. So I was very prudish, I think. No longer am I pretty <laughs> like then I was. So. <laughs> I've grown up since then. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you for sharing that. Now, I'd like to take you to the 35-year-old Sarah. Mm. We've jumped on a bit. Oh, I can't hear you, Jill. Oh, can't you? I can now. Can you hear me? I can, can hear you. Hear me now? Okay. Yeah. So I'd like you to think about what you were doing at 35. Where were you then? What was happening? Now that's a very, um, I'm feeling emotional just thinking about this one. Um, I got married at 32. Um, I met my husband in July 1992 and we got married in December 1992. So we barely wow. knew each other. Uh, I was at Goldman Sachs working really long hours. All as God sent, really. Um, would often be in the office at 6 o'clock in the morning, leaving at 11 o'clock at night. And that period of time when I was newly married, I tried to be superwoman. I was working those crazy long hours and then coming home wanting to be the best wife, best lover, best hostess. Because um, I could do those things too, but you know, the reality was I couldn't do them all at the same time. And by the time I was 35, I had burnt myself out and I was in the Priory Hospital. So it was a very, very challenging period of time, actually. And it took me, in reality, five years to get back on track to, find, to hold down a prestigious job again, but 15 years to get well again. Mm. So, um, it's really interesting how, um, and I, I, I don't know where I picked that age from, but so many people had a, um, a pivotal year when they were. Yeah. It could have been a good thing or a bad thing, um, but I would say a good 90% of people, uh, uh, this question has brought up a pivotal part of their life. And, and for a lot of women, because you and I actually, uh, although you work with men too, I know that you're very passionate about working with women and working with women who are burning out because we've mm -hmm. both been in that situation. Um, and that kind of trying to be superwoman thing is uh, really one of the things that, we both address you, you from one sense, and me more from a, a health and well-being perspective. Uh, but, but similarly, you know, it's a, it's a very similar thing. Yeah, yeah um, it's fascinating for me. It's fascinating because I, um, I think all of the assumptions I made about you know, earning money, holding down a good job, what a good wife should be, I had never challenged. Hmm pick them up along the way from my environment and I imagine them to be so and live my life that way. And you know, it doesn't have, you can choose. That's the thing. You yeah. can choose. Yeah. yeah and I, I think you're right. And that, you know, all the work that I've done 
uh, you know, on, on myself, which is principally where, you know, we need to be concentrating on. It's that realization that it actually is all a choice. And, you know, the, the wider you make the difference between what you have and what you want gives you that space to make those choices, actually. And of course, because we live this fast 21st century world, there's, there's not enough space, is there? There's not enough space in your head. There's not enough space in the day. There's not enough space to eat properly or to exercise properly. So you you, you can't make those choices because there's there's not enough room to make those choices. Well, I, well, I think you're saying really is we can't make these con choices consciously, but of mm. course we are choosing all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're just not doing it consciously. And I think that was what I learned in my recovery, and it did take a long time. That actually was I choosing consciously, and was it the choice I wanted? Um, mm single step away because if it isn't then you're heading in the wrong direction and you'll have a burnout at some point in my yeah absolutely we see it a lot don't we okay thank you very much for sharing that now i've got some um quick fire questions now Ooh, okay <laughs> this is the quick fire round so it uh, just requires you know uh, uh, an either or usually so don't worry about it okay so um on the whole do you prefer listening to the radio or watching the tv Radio, absolutely. Hardly watch television at all. Okay. And uh, do you prefer fiction or non-fiction? I'm a bit of a learning junkie, so I enjoy fiction a lot, but I spend my time reading non-fiction. Okay. And I know, because the next question is about where you are in your family, oldest, middle or youngest child, and actually you're a middle child, aren't you? I am, number two of four. So, yeah. Number two of four, yeah. Okay, and so at school, um, I'm really talking about kind of after 11 in your secondary school or whatever you want to call it. Um, were you a goody two-shoes? Were you a class clown? Were you under the radar or were you a bit of a handful? I was definitely a goody two-shoes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm, and, and um, you know, I've got a son. Um, I'm blessed now to have a son despite years and years of infertility because I put my life through so much stress. However, he came along when I was 46 and he is far from a goody two-shoes. And I look at him in admiration and horror at the same time on occasion. <laughs> he has the balls to do and he will go far. And it's not that I haven't gone far. It's just that I, I hid for such a long time under this goody two shoe stuff. But, mm. yeah, so it means to be a quick fire round. Sorry. Sorry, Jill. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. Um, and so, uh, OK, well, uh, next question is, um, what's your best habit at the moment? My best habit. My best habit. Ah. Uh, Actually, on reflection, it's a very easy answer. Protecting my sleep. Ah, that's a really good habit to have. Yeah, and yeah. just having the awareness of how much sleep I'm getting has yeah. made a positive difference. You know, I'm using a Fitbit to um, yes. monitor my sleep. It's not perfect, but it certainly gives me some information. Yes. Um, I have a better version of that. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so I know if I've got, and I do now, I'm very strategic with my sleep. So if I've got a big um, event coming up or mm. somewhere I absolutely need to be, I will ensure that I get a week of good sleep. It makes a huge difference. So that's yeah. my best habit. Yeah, but cool. as with all habits, you fall off the wagon from time to time. Oh, yeah, time. that's what habits are about. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so last night I went to the theatre. I had some friends staying over from Canada. Um, we saw The Ferryman, which is extraordinary. Uh -huh. Irish. Irish play and um, I ended up having five hours of sleep last night well when I'm going to catch up with a nap this afternoon yeah exactly so as long as you as long as you don't do that regularly yeah yeah um, because sleep has so much when it well that's a whole nother story I won't get into what I do as you know you know um, health and well-being and sleep is one of those those important pillars that you need to to sort out okay so that was your best habit then uh, so what's your worst habit I'm an all or nothing drinker not, I mean, I don't get drunk, but I'm very, I can not drink of an evening um, yeah. at all. And I don't, I might miss it, but I don't, um, I'm not going up the walls or anything. But I can't just have one glass. If only I could. <laughs> I might have a couple of glasses. And I, I wish I could do that. With you, but I, yeah, that's my, what I think of as my worst habit. That I just okay, like right, less <laughs> as opposed to, um, yeah. So I might I, I end up having to do nothing as opposed to something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. and um, what do you do to relax? Well, I use um, a gadget to help me with my meditation. I learned to meditate when I was pregnant, and it was the most extraordinary thing on the morning that my son was born to be have us both hooked up onto those monitors 
and me to do a meditation and see the impact on him. Mm. Oh, I fell asleep um, every time I started meditating and I could prove it. But what was even more wonderful was after he was born, even if he, if he was crying and in the same room or even in the same house, if I meditated, he would quieten down. Oh, um, that's amazing. Really fantastic. But these days I'm using something called Brain Tap, which is um, a gadget. I should have brought it to show you. It goes over your ears and your eyes and it puts pulses of sound and light through those senses and gives you a guided meditation, which means I can get into a meditative state much quicker and I can stay there. Is this from Jason? Is this from Jason? Yeah, Jason, I bought, yeah Jason Gould um, is the Brain Tap um, agent for the UK. Yeah, Highly that's fine. It's, it's, um, I find it fabulous. So. I've never tried it, but we, he introduced it to me. We, I know he was just talking about it probably three years ago. Um, maybe, maybe as long as ago as that. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So, um, uh, next question is, do you have any nicknames or have you ever had any nicknames? I have. I've had a few. So my grandfather used to call me Gertie Gone Flotty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but I kind of like that name. Kind of feels like it suits me on the inside, yeah. even if it's a bit of a goody two shoes on the outside. Um, Gertie Gone Flotty was my nickname my granddad gave me, and then um, I had a boyfriend who I was very much in love with when I was uh, in my early to mid twenties. And at that time, my father was the managing director of Host Seasons, and I used to um, every boat show at Earl's Court. I used to be on the stand and work for ten days selling host season's holidays. Anyway, this boyfriend's father decided to nickname me Ho. Uh -huh. from Hosey, um, which that nickname has stuck. So there are people um, who've known me from back then who still call me Ho. Hey. Uh, and um, of course it sounds very oriental and then people who don't know me think, hey, where does that come from? <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's my nickname, but, uh, you know, two. two. Two very different ones. Okay, brilliant. All right, now, so we are going to have a music uh, question now. Okay. Um, so um, I don't know whether you know this. I'm not sure if you know this. You might know this. Um, th that when I was in Norwich, I studied music at university. Did you? No, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, so I play classical guitar. I've played it since I was eight, and um, I did. But I did singing at university, and so I, I've always sung, and I still sing now. So if I was on stage. And I grabbed you up on stage with me. Uh, what would you choose as your karaoke song? Oh, um, you make me feel my love. To make me feel my love. The um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. so I'm, yeah. I'm trying to think who sings it. Um, well, very Adele sings it, but I think oh, it yeah, was Bob, yeah, yeah. Dylan, Bob Dylan who um, yes sings it. And uh, I, well, I think it is, it's very funny. My, my siblings and I do sing. None of us have been um, properly trained, mm -hmm. but we've done amateur dramatics and we were all in the sound of music. And my, sibling, my siblings were children and I was a nun. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do about Maria? Uh, well, yes, so these, uh, Von Trapp singers are the, the good ones, but we as a family come out at family occasions, weddings. Um, we haven't done it at funerals yet, but certainly big parties. Um, and the Von Crap singers come and do <laughs> their gig. So for my mother's 80th, there was my, all of us four siblings, plus our partners, so there's eight of us, singing an a cappella version of Hey Big Spender when we uh -huh. changed it. So we do um, sing in a very amateur dramatic sort of way. And um, we have another wedding coming up next year with my niece and we are just plotting and planning what we can Practicing, sing. yes. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Oh, I love it that you can sing, that's great. Okay, so um, there's another, this is another scenario now. That's the quick fire round over. I've got another scenario for you. So I think okay. we're about the same age you and I now. Together for 35 years this year. Mm. And uh, two years ago, we went off to America. Uh, we were going to a wedding, actually, in Yellowstone Park. And um, we planned a holiday, a month's holiday, around the whole holiday, around the, the wedding, I should say. And we traveled eight states in um, three, 3,300 miles in that time. Mm. We had somebody planning the flights and all the hotels. So all we needed to do was just rock up. So there was no stress involved in any of it. And throughout that whole month, we didn't have a crossword at all. 
Mm. So I'd like to know if if you were to have a similar holiday where everything was organised for you, who would you take with you that you could spend a month with without a crossword? Mm. Um, I think there is only one person in my world that I would not have a crossword with for a month, and that would be my partner. <laughs> Happy I'm days. So, <laughs> I'm so lucky. Um, I have a lovely partner called Johnny Heavens. Don't you think that's so good? <laughs> Um, it's not a porno name, it's a real name. Um, and yes, I could definitely spend a month with him without a crossword. I couldn't do that with my son, and I probably couldn't do that with my siblings, certainly not my mother. <laughs> well, it's, what I've learned is, because I work a lot with um, Cheryl Chapman and Marion Bevington in the Live, Love, Laugh Lounge in their Find Their Why Foundation, and uh, they do a lot of genetic blueprinting, and yesterday I was actually at an event helping them uh, with their programs and with their books and so on. And on the way home, Cheryl and I were in the car, you know, as you do, ch 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 chattering away. And I know what my genetic blueprint is. I've, I've seen it. It's a, it's a very, it's a kind of East meets West, more old science meets modern science. It's very complicated and it's incredibly accurate. And Cheryl says to me, there are basically five types of people, and I'm one particular type of people. And we were talking about the fact that all of my shows, you know, obviously mention my husband and the fact that we've been together for a long time, which is, you know, um, in this day and age, is quite unusual. And we, you know, we spend weeks on a narrowboat together. And there's, you know, we have the best time in, in those situations. And she did my profile, and then she did Peter's profile, and she put them together. And we actually complete each other. Mm, how wonderful. It's lovely. It's really lovely. because there are, It's complicated to explain without actually seeing it. Um, so we're not in conflict. We are actually in completion. So things that are open for me, he closes. Things that are closed for me, I open for him. Mm. Um, and so it's just very, very obvious that this is. This. Mm. Well, I'm intrigued by that. Yeah, it's really intriguing. And um, and of course, we then did it for my children and said, well, why is it that these two kids get on better? And why is it that this relationship with one daughter is different to the other daughter and my son with me? And, you know, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, but, you know, so you can almost predict, really, because like you, I met my husband. Yeah. Uh, it took us a while to get married, but, you know, we, we were literally together from that moment. Um, and I, I think it's my partner four years ago. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, eventually, if you're open to it, you just find the right person. Yeah. OK, so um, now thank you for sharing that. And I shared a little bit of mine then, didn't I? Yeah. So uh, the next question is uh, another music question. So alongside this book um, that is being commissioned, I'm in the middle of writing it, I'm transcribing all the all the things. Um, this book is actually going around the world in 80 days. So the people that are included in the book. Mm -hmm. You you and your profile and a bit about you is going around the world on the Jules Verne journey. Do you, do you know that around the world in 80 days? No, not by no idea. But. Um, so basically from October the 2nd next year, so we're um, choosing the start and, eight, and end date, October the 2nd, 2018. This book will go around the world starting in London um, and it will go to Egypt, Bombay, Calcutta, Shanghai, Yokohama, San Francisco, New York, Bordeaux, Cobbin Island, and come back to London on something like December the 21st. And so, um, physically, physically. Physically, the book's going around. So the, the Ben Salmi family are touring, doing that 80-day 80 80 day tour, and the book is physically going around. So, for example, if you're in San Francisco you can, and you're in the book, you can go and sign it because you're mm -hmm. in the book. Um, which is really exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Um, but what I also wanted to do was, because of my love, love and passion for music, was to have um, not only that legacy from these questions, these conversations I'm having, but I also wanted to create a music legacy as well. So I'm inviting all of my guests to choose one song um, to go onto a playlist that I'm going to create alongside the book. Um, and that song has to be one that makes you feel lighthearted. Okay. Um, I'm hoping no one's chosen this one. Um, it's called, I think it's called Mamba the Poet. No, nobody's chosen that one. Who's that by? By that called Yasun Endor. I might have to send you the link or the thing because it's an unusual surname. Um, it, 
makes me want to dance just listening to this music. And there's a little phrase in it for those who want to dig it out and listen to it. But it sounds like it's talking about having an itchy bum and it just makes you <laughs> laugh. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece. I'm going to send you the link directly after. Well, you can post it when we when this this oh, when we're okay. here, You can post it underneath this video, and people can listen to it. Yeah, it's um, that'd be a cool thing. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're coming to the near to the end, but I have kind of my very most important question to ask you before we go, from my point of view. Now you know um, that you know now a little bit that one of my big passions is music, but of course my biggest passion and my business is all based around um, heart health and well-being and particularly hearts and gut health on the basis that we need to build health rather than stop treating symptoms and I've written a book called the heart of a woman how to look after the heart you give to the world which is on Amazon I don't think you've got a copy yet but I'm going to send you one um, so I'd like to know um, from your perspective what you do to look after your heart so Firstly, from a physical point of view, how do you look after yourself physically, but also emotionally and spiritually? How do you look after the heart that you, you give to the world? Mm, good question. Um, oh, boy, am I so much better now. <laughs> um, but I, and, of course, it's the wake-up call I had. And I now sort of live my life, not perfectly by any stretch of the imagination, but this idea that I need to be in harmony with myself and that every single cell in my body is listening. So I'm pretty good at making sure I'm drinking water, not just wine. Um, my sleep, I'm, I'm exercise is sporadic, but I know that if I do something every day, so I do have my 10,000 steps. I, I don't call that exercise, however. Um, it counts, actually. But it, it, well, I'm sure it, help, it helps, and yet I know if I don't do my exercise, my mood mm. uh, diminishes. And you know, since I started running, I've not suffered from depression, which again is fantastic feedback for me. Mm. Um, so it's all about increased awareness, being really conscious about what I need. So the sleep and the hydration, always, always there. Exercise, the company I keep. You know, I'm I'm now very picky with the people I hang out with. They have to be what my mother calls. Uh, radiators not dreams <laughs> yes. I have um, a, I have a friend who says that uh, you know he says oh, oh that person uses up a lot of oxygen in the room that's one of his expressions yeah, yeah. and you can tell can't you and and mm. that's okay sometimes you have those um, in your environment and you have to spend some time but mm. you can limit that time and create boundaries to look after yourself so um, I'm I do that much more um, readily these days than I ever did before. I felt duty bound and wasn't serving me. Um, so that's probably the physical things I do. And the other one was about the spiritual side, you yeah, say? The emotional side. So how do you protect yourself emotionally and spiritually? What do you well, um, the thing that comes to me about the yourself. spiritual side yeah. in particular is around nature. Um, mm. But things in harmony. So I really love um, what I think of as Zen views. And I create little Zen views everywhere I go so there are my house isn't always tidy don't get me wrong but even in the untidiness I can have a little zen view so in my kitchen I've got a little slit of a window that then goes out into the garden and it, it in that slit view is a, a, um, a thing that I love at the end of the garden um, and when I walk around the corner into my kitchen one of my favorite trees which is a, an acer tree is in my line of vision mm -hmm. so I love to create um, places that give me joy um, and I inc increased my joy quota recently and I I sold my engagement ring and I thought okay well I don't want to fritter away that money I want to have something for the rest of my life that I really enjoy and I've got a portrait of my son done and it makes me smile every time I walk past it and of course I managed to get it when he's 12 so he's still got that boy look he's not got yeah, that yeah, man man man. look yet yeah. And um, I'm just so pleased I did that. So I yeah, create, create Zen views. And emotionally, um, having courageous conversations is how I look after myself and mm -hmm. my relationships is, is you know, I no longer fester things. I might journal them out, but I certainly get them out of my system. And get I, them out of your system, yeah. And I, I commit, my partner and I committed 
to having courageous conversations. That's a lovely expression. Agreements avoid disagreements, and you can so easily make the wrong assumption and mm. get better unnecessarily. So a little bit to do with your genetic makeup if you're falling out. Anyway, we all know about that now. <laughs> well, yes, I, well, I think see, for me, um, I wouldn't fall out. And yeah. I would internalize it. Yeah, exactly. Those screws and feelings ended up coming out as depression years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so other people would just Very see common. me as an accommodating, perfect little yes. person. Yes, I was uh, always happy. <laughs> yeah, my, my mother used to say, well, no one likes being with anyone who's not smiling. So I went around mm -hmm. with a smile on my face, but actually it wasn't what it felt like on inside. Well, that conditioning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, but, well, that. thank you very much for sharing that. I hope you've enjoyed our light on. I have. It wasn't really painful have. at all, was it? No, it wasn't painful at all. But what was interesting about the whole experience is that one of the things I, I do, because my history has shown that I can get into myself in an anxious, unresourceful state, so I, I make sure I have some level of certainty around anything I'm doing. Uh, and then, of course, this one, I, I didn't have that opportunity. It. Particularly around the technology aspect at the beginning. It's like, oh, this is putting me through my face. And I survived. Isn't that wonderful? Well, you know, we sorted it out. It was all good. We were a bit late starting, but we sorted it out. Okay, so um, fabulous. Before we go, though, there's one very important thing that I want you to do, which is to share with everybody who's listening and everybody that will listen on to the, to the replays as well, because this will go on live. But then uh, the more we share it together, then the more, the more viewers will be able to, to see our conversation. Um, so I'd like you to share with us, please, um, a little bit more about what's coming up for you, what your in terms of business this time. So what are you excited about? What you're working on? Whilst you do that, I'm going to post your uh, link to your Facebook page. You do have a a website as well, sarahsparks.co.uk. Um, but you asked me to 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 post your Facebook um, page, yes, so I'm going to people can link with you there. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Sorry? Also LinkedIn, but I can put that link in that thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But in terms um, of what's going on, I'm, I'm excited. Um, so my life has completely changed in the last 18 months, two years, by virtue of my mother's 80th, actually. Nothing to do with work. But as a consequence of that, I ended up doing um, public speaker university. And... Um, that has completely changed my life. So I, for those who don't know anything about Public Speaker University, it's a four-day training that helps you speak confidently in public, but that's not all. <laughs> it also helps you create um, and pull together what's unique about you and what you love and what you want to get out in the world. And that bit I wasn't expecting. Well, you and I wouldn't be uh, here without that, actually. No, absolutely. And I wouldn't know Cheryl and I wouldn't know Jason Gould and you know, Jess and James and Dee. And you know, there's so many lovely people. And people who've been really influential, Sammy Blindell, for example. So anyway, so I've got coming up as a consequence of all this, I've been getting out in the world and sharing my research around thriving. And I do that in my masterclasses. I run them regularly. I think the next one's on the 10th of October. I'm running in um, London Bridge. Um, and I can, again, I can post the link for that. Um, I run these masterclasses so I can share what are the five key things that have people who don't burn out and don't get stressed what are they doing differently from people like me? There's people caught in the busy trap and not able to get off and feel they have no choice. So I share this research um, and practical tools and techniques that they can immediately go away and apply. So on the 10th of October, which is World Mental Health Day, mm -hmm. um, I'm running a masterclass at lunchtime. I'm planning on running a webinar in the evening. Um, one of the webinars I ran early on had 1,100 people attend and 94% of them said they immediately go away and apply what they learned. So I know that what I'm sharing is helpful and that really lights my fire and, and gets me out there doing more of it. Um, so regular masterclasses can be found. I run a two-day event uh, once a quarter. So this is the Choose to Thrive Accelerator program that gets people really on track because it's all very well knowing the theory but how do you implement this stuff into your life? So the two days are very much a practical way of how do I implement all of these wonderful strategies so that they can continue to help me shift my life in the right direction. I get such good feedback from those two days. I'm, I'm loving it. Just completed one. Well, the next one is January, I think, 13th and 14th, of, uh, which is a Saturday and Sunday. Um, but I have um, – last week was a pretty amazing week – I got chosen to be part of what's called the Changemaker television series in the States. 
So I'm flying out to Ecuador um, in the middle of November to be put through my paces. Um, I feel sure apparently it's the most amazing learning experience. But we're out there to change the world. Um, so they throw together 20 to 30 change makers. And not only do we do our own personal development and growth work, but we also go out into the community. And I think part of our challenge, they won't tell us very much about it, but part of our challenge is to start bringing clean water to a community that doesn't have clean water. So I'm very excited about that. I have no idea really mm -hmm. what I'm getting myself in for, but that's my philosophy these days, certainly. So oh, yes. the, yeah, I'm going to say yes. Just see what happens. I'm just going to say yes. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm writing in my book, which will be out, um, I don't think, early in 2018, but it will be out in 2018. Mm. Um, all about this, you know, what are the things you need to do differently to thrive at work in particular. So you've got much more um, success in your relationships, in your health, your wealth. Every aspect can be changed if you know and choose wisely about your how to thrive. So that's happening. Um, what else is happening? Well, whatever's happening, they can connect with you on Facebook, can't they? And you, they you can, and I guess that's the thing. On Facebook, I share lots of um, yeah. related articles and stuff and write some of my own. But I also, on the Thrive Tribe, which is part of a group which people are welcome to join, I share daily tips and techniques about how to get your life back on track. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely. And... Uh, um, I know that you're looking to come to the to the Stardust Awards. I know you'll just be back from Ecuador. I know. Um, so if you'd like to come to the red carpet event, because uh, this is at the Royal Horse, Horse Guards Hotel in, in central London, and it's really you need to wear sparkles, black tie, um, amazing um, company, three course, uh, really amazing. I went last year. Um, and that was really the event that was the catalyst to kind of the things that. How exciting. Down to those stardust people, people like Marina and Dari who put the event on. And uh, so I know that you're going to come to that, but you know, you can invite people to come to that red carpet. Hopefully you're going to come and maybe you can bring your husband as well because you won't have seen you for a while. <laughs> well, um, he's not my husband yet. Oh, but... no, sorry, your partner. That's okay. I, th I think we'd, we'd like to be, but we have, we're, not, we're not there yet. <laughs> I'd love you to be Mrs. Heaven. I know. I know. <laughs> you have to do that. <laughs> I think the idea of sparks and heavens together is just delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly it's... sparks. Sparkly heaven. Mm. <laughs> What's I not know. to love? You were meant to be together, you see. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely right. Okay. Well, so, thank you again very much for um, spending your time with us this morning. I'm very grateful. It's been delightful. There I'm really pleased to. There you are. Not Thank traumatic you. at all. I think we've had a great time. So um, yeah. we're going to keep in touch because we've got lots of things that we need to talk about because there's lots of things that we have in common. Um, um, so uh, I hope everybody has a beautiful Sunday, even though it's raining. Yes. Get out and about, connect with nature. And uh, I'm my next shows are not till, I think, um, not next week, but the week after. My last shows in this series are going to be on something like the 18th of October, something like that. So those are my last four shows that I'm going to do. Um, because and I can watch them now. Because yes, and now I know. Yeah, you can watch them now. You can go and watch them. Be nosy. Find out who wants what, who likes what. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Find out people's nicknames. You know all sorts of things. Who they want to spend the lift thing with. Who? How many of them don't choose their partner to take on holiday with them? I know. <laughs> yeah, it's great stuff. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll speak soon. Say goodbye yeah. to everybody. Lots of love, everyone. Nice to see you.